The Witness has done pretty well for an expensive indie game where you draw lines on squares. What are you doing looking so sad with your arms like that? Oh, he's a juggler! Let's put a smile on that face. The game has a lot of depth to both the puzzles, the design of the world, with all of its intricate little visual tricks. Oh look, it's some eyes! And unravelling the overarching mystery of what it's all about. Oh look, I'm an angel. Just kidding, I'm the... Hold, hold, hold. I'm the king! Whether you enjoy the puzzles or the more unique components of the storytelling in Jonathan Blow's latest, I think it's worthwhile to take the time to look back at his previous hit from 2008, Braid. In my videos I like to offer alternative perspectives on things and contribute to people's processes, so I thought I'd make a video detailing the six things I personally think make Braid truly special. Why six? Well, because there's six worlds in Braid. That's actually a coincidence, I just don't want to do five. What a terrible number. It's liney, it's curvy. Make up your mind, five! Number one! Visual craftsmanship! All the game's visuals have been polished to a mirror shine. The animated painting cloud background in the level selects are mesmerising, and Tim himself is an animated painting. It must have taken ages to get each frame looking right with all the shading on his hair and stuff. Also, despite being rendered in a somewhat painterly style, Tim still looks cartoonish when it works. His death animation has a couple of frames of just... Wow. I'm dead now. That sucks. I wasn't expecting this. You see this checklist of enemies to kill? Each one is a unique drawing. Drawing? Uh, drawing? Draw how do you... Each one is a unique picture, and each X as you kill them is unique too. It adds a sense of personalization to the level, along with finding work for the artist to do. It's a pity they were paid in exposure. Number two! Owl swim Imagery! This sounds a lot like the previous one, but there's a big difference between simply looking cool and using your visuals to enhance the story's meaning. Braid does both, so it gets to different points. Look at these little guys. Don't they remind you of something? Hmm, what about this guy? And the design of this area? Jump... man? The princess is in another castle. What does that remind me of? And you collect stars too? This is Mario! The game's Marioing you! But why? Far more than for a cheap reference, the game presents itself as an alternative version of a Mario game. Miyamoto's fairly open about how saving a princess is really just a quick excuse for the gameplay to happen. That's why it's the same premise as Zelda. The actual story in early games was treated as genuinely unimportant. Braid offers a different version of events where instead of a literal journey to save an actual princess, Mario's on a deeper, almost spiritual quest for meaning, where meaning might even be unattainable. You know, if you watch Mario backwards, Mario's actually the bad guy, leaving the princess in Bowser's clutches before walking out backwards for some reason, and resurrecting bad guys on his way back home. Wow. Rude. On top of this, the enemies are all designed to look just a little bit like Tim. Given that the game can be a metaphor for Tim getting over himself or doing battle with his own psyche, it's nice that the enemies have a Timness to them. Alongside this, the bad guy slash good guy, depending on your point of view, oh it's so deep, we see at the end, doesn't he look a little Tim-like himself? Similar hairstyle, but amped up to be cartoonishly over the top and with this sort of hyper-masculine look to him, but still. Also, here's a cool thing. At this point, almost everyone knows the twist where when you finish the game and hit reverse, you realise the princess was running away from you and not the guy. Well, in the backwards version, his face is actually different. He's less angry looking. Using visual changes, the game is making a subtle point that not only do events look different backwards, but there's a little bit of unreliable narratorship going on. And when we see what's really happening, he's far less creepy. He also doesn't give off a cartoonishly evil roar. Visual and ordeal signifiers like this help to create the sense that Tim literally sees people he doesn't like as cartoonish bad guys. Your ex's old boyfriends always seem like total assholes, why can't Tim's? Oh Kevin, just you wait until I invent the atomic bomb! That'll wipe the smile off your fa- No! Wait! He's me! I'm battling my own repressed failures! No! Number three. Death. When you die in a video game, it restarts. It's treated as a that-didn't-happen moment. Mario didn't actually die just there. Let's try again. Death isn't final because it gets overridden. In Braid, when you die, everything stops. You just hang here, on the precipice. 
You have to literally go back and prevent the death for him to continue. It takes a logical leap from previous games. You're actually making sure what happened didn't happen. You're unhappening it. But the game's approach to death doesn't end there. Death is an intrinsic part of the world of Braid. Loads of puzzles rely on Tim causing the deaths of other creatures in ways that benefit him, giving him extra lift for a jump or making it carry a key to him, or using the bodies of cute little bunnies with flowers on them to block cannon fire. Oh my god! Oh my god! <gasps> this room, which is my favourite room in the whole game by the way, hammers this point home perfectly. Because in order to go through that door, you have to walk just far enough that this poor little guy has to die. You have no choice. And given that he looks like you, it's kind of like this weird suicide thing? I don't know. Tim even has to kill himself over and over to progress. His quest is built on the corpses of many, even his own. But especially bunnies. Nomma wir. Très I can't do German or French, and I tried to do both. Um, number four, true depth. I see a lot of theories on the net that rely on the princess as a metaphor for the atomic bomb. These people are wrong, and will pay for their crimes. There's only two clear references to the atomic bomb in the game, when I think what makes the game interesting is the story's purposeful vagueness. There's Tim, and there's the princess with a capital, the. The journey can represent a lot of different things. The idea that there's one true meaning is inherently flawed, and the story becomes more about a general human quest for meaning. When people found the second ending, Jonathan Blow insisted the game still had more in it to find. This pissed off a lot of people who had combed the game's files and conclusively found that there weren't. But Blow was right. There is more to find, and it's this thing called personal meaning. Anyone can Google what does the princess represent, or the authors of the quotes that pepper the world's storybooks, but what makes Braid truly fascinating, at least in relative video game storytelling terms, is that you don't need any of that. You can think about its relevance to you individually. You can fill in the blanks of Tim's life and decisions and thoughts in your own particular way. And that's awesome. Number five. Some parts aren't fun on purpose, and this is fine. The game, if anything, is improved by the parts of it that are annoying. For example, there's a star you can only get by sitting and waiting two hours while a cloud moves across the screen. The game's hardest challenge is literally designed to be boring and unfun, to teach you something about how silly it is to seek 100% completion simply for the sake of having done everything. I like Jonathan Blow, and not just because I have the unstoppable urge to seek out people equally as pretentious and egotistical as me, but because he's not under any illusions about the game's failures. Even though the game purposefully has parts that aren't entertaining, Jonathan Blow doesn't use this as an excuse for bad game design. He's completely open about aspects of the game he feels he did wrong. You know, and this canon ends up killing people for no interesting reason. It's like, oh, I didn't, I didn't go through with the right timing, and now I just have to try again and again, and some people, like, try ten times to get through there. It's not cool. It's not what the game's about. This willingness to criticise his own design work, even while defending parts of the game that purposefully aren't fun, reveals the viability for games as a medium to be more than Skinner boxes that give out good feelings when you do the right thing. This is just my opinion, but I think there's an artistic merit to annoying someone, or punishing them for acting without thinking, or making them wait for something they don't really need. This level doesn't even have a name, because the feeling you get watching your own self die to help you can't be described in words. In being willing to explore these alternative emotions beyond simple satisfaction with having solved a puzzle, the game doesn't just do something different, it also makes a case for the power games can have as a medium to even do this sort of thing. That's pretty radical when you think about it. Except Blow is wrong about the canon, he knows why you put it there. It's because he's a monster. And finally, number six. Uh, it's secretly a book! While lots of games have audio logs and journal entries that push the while lots of games have audio logs and journal entries that push the plot forward in a basic way, few games encourage you to actually sit and think about something, or read what amounts to a story about a visit to your parents' house, quite like Braid does. The text portions are completely optional, but offer another layer of meaning to each world's gimmicks. It's quite well written prose, too. Plenty of games have good writing in the sense that characters say something funny or the story is explained uh, effectively, but I really can't think of another game that has writing in this specific sense, the sense where you can actually stop and contemplate its meaning, like with a good book. And I'm a fan of books myself. I'm a bookie. I'll see you all at BookCon 2016. I was going to do the dramatic thing where I throw the books in the air and they collapse down, but that is not how you treat books. That is not right. 
Speaking of time travel, if I had the power to go back in time, I would use it to unread this. It's like a fucking early access beta of To Kill a Mockingbird. Also, I'd probably go back even further and become the head of Puffin or whoever publishes this garbage, and I would hire a better graphic designer, because you don't put the name of the previous book in the same size next to the text there, so it says Go Setter To Kill a Watchman Mockingbird. That doesn't make any sense. Get your ass in gear, Harper. Jonathan Blow's next game, The Witness, has audio logs as well, but uses them to tell a story in a kind of sideways way that's kind of cool. All the logs are quotes from various places that don't really have a direct relevance to the game in a way that I think forces you to go, what? And figure out what's actually going on for yourself. Without just, you know, piecing together, oh, this, this, this one says there's demons coming through a hole. Uh, so now I know the story. Oh great. Instead, imagine if you played a version of Doom 3 where the diary entries were like a fucking two-minute quote from a philosopher and you're like, what the f- what the fuck, John Carmack? Well, guess what? It would be a better game. The Witness also builds on these ideas by having a literal projection booth where you can sit and watch extracts from real documentaries. It's not the same as the books exactly, but it has a similar feel. You can watch James Burke talk about how art is worthless and have a good long think about the differing purposes of art and science. I think that's neat. Oh, spoilers, that happens in The Witness, sorry. That should honestly be a new way that we rate games. You know, uh, story, graphics, sound, gameplay. Can you listen to James Burke tell you that art is shit? You may find Blow himself pretentious or dumb or overreaching, but he made a fine game and encouraged people to think more about games and stories and even life. Even if, in your opinion, he's not the best at it, I think even attempting to think about these things has value. This week I'd also like to spare... Spe <sighs> This week I'd also like to pay an extra special thanks to Amanda Beverly, Alexander Corbett, Kieran Dactler, Rob Brunt, Jenny Angel, and Kevin Kneip. Kneep? Tell me how to pronounce that and I'll do it better next time, I'm sorry. Thanks very much for watching, hope you liked it. Uh, this is kind of a new thing for me, so uh, please give me any constructive criticism you can, uh, unless it's negative feedback, in which case write it on a physical piece of paper and throw it in the bin. If you like this video, please consider giving me money on Patreon. Uh, for two dollars or more, you can get access to a bunch of the uh, bonus stuff that I either cut out of videos because it's like an outtake or just doesn't fit anymore, and just also stuff that can't go in because it's me playing through a game and talking over it for the sake of the footage with this video and stuff. If for my next video you want me to talk about the philosophy of Dark Souls 2, and yes, specifically Dark Souls 2, click this uh, sphinx, on this side of the screen. But if instead you'd prefer me to talk about why Fallout 3 is garbage, please click on this orc-ized version of the originally interesting and cool super mutant characters from the original games. Say goodbye, Cody. Oh, wave, wave at him. He doesn't speak English. <laughs> <laughs>